as I said several times already, I think the doctrine of man may be one of the most important doctrines of our day. Uh, now, we can, you know, we can parse that out. Of course, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, all extremely important. But I would say the doctrine of, of, of man is because what, what we are confronted with most every day is how this reality, this misunderstanding of the doctrine of man, like hits us in the face almost every single day. So we've already looked at being made in God's image, uh, being made to, to rule, exercise dominion. And today we're looking at a specific aspect of what does it mean to be created in God's image, meaning being made male and female. Uh, so just, just a couple headings we want to kind of look at tonight. Number one, God's glory is displayed in both genders. We know that everything in all of creation was made for Jesus Christ. It was made by and for Jesus Christ and for his glory. We live for his glory. And just on the outset, both male and female were created by God, and they both were created for his glory. Now, understanding the, 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 the ancient uh, times, the times of when Moses would have wrote this, when they were wandering, when Israel was wandering in the wilderness, uh, even thinking about the, the first century when, when Jesus came and, and lived, this idea would have been revolutionary, that male and female were both created for God's glory. And both of them were given this command to exercise dominion and be fruitful. So both male and female are in some way able to collaborate, to, to live together in a way to to bring God's glory over the whole entire earth. Number two, male and female were created equal. It's a subset of what I was just saying. They're both created for God's glory, but they're also created equal. Uh, we, we see this all throughout the, the scripture. Uh, maybe a couple verses for us. You want to just hold your place here and, and go to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. There are several passages when we think about the, the, the roles of men and women that this passage will often be be talked about, but this passage is not about the roles of males and females, but it's about their equality. So in Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 23, um, Paul writes to the church of Galatia, churches of Galatia, now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor f and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's off offspring, heirs according to the promise. Just a couple points here. One, it says that you are all sons of God. That, that's, a, that's an intentional usage there, right? You are all sons of God, meaning that you, as a female, were, were counted as a son, as an heir to the promises given to the firstborn. This promogenture, which was so prevalent in, in the ancient days, said so the firstborn son was the one who had all the inheritance. So it says here, it says male and female are what? They both are all sons in the eyes of the Lord. I mean, you have the inheritance of of God. So in verse 28 specifically, there is neither Jew nor Greek. That means there is no Jew or Greek who are better. The Jews are not looking down upon the Greeks, and the Greeks are not looking down upon the Jews. There is no slave nor free. The slaves do not look down upon the free, and the free do not look down upon the slaves. There is neither male and female. Males do not look down upon females, and females do not look down upon males, because you all have been put into Christ, and if you are in Christ, you are one. This was revolutionary in, in the first century. You see that primarily here, but you see that other places in, in Luke's gospel in particular, right? Luke has a way of kind of taking those who are, who are looked down upon in society and lifting them up. So the poor are, are exalted uh, and the rich are laid low. And in, in the gospel of Luke, what you see several times in his, in his gospel, women are kind of rising up. So you see Luke chapter 8, verse 1 through 4, it says the the women who were with Jesus were paying his living expenses. So the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ himself was supported and encouraged and provided for by women. Uh, even how we see that the, the women were the first to, to run and find Jesus in, or to find Jesus, uh, uh, not find Jesus after his resurrection. So what you see here, you see all throughout the, 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 the Bible, God is highlighting the equality of male and female. Now again, 
it's for some of us, that's like a, a, like a duh moment. Thanks, Pastor. I came here on a Wednesday night after a long day for you to tell me what I already know, okay? But this is an important thing because what I'm going to say next in terms of how, how we're not just the same, but yet we're different, that is the, is the thing that, 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 that jars people. But if you don't hear the, the first thing, that we're all equal, then we, we, we miss the, the point of how God has created us. Uh, we heard this a little bit uh, at our marriage retreat, those who were able to come. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 7, it says to husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, for you are co-heirs of the kingdom of heaven. Meaning you are equal. You are the same in Christ. There is no male and female in Christ because you are all one. Jesus Christ laid down his life and died for males and for females, right? He was dead in the ground and was raised, rose from the dead to justify male and female. You are all the same. Now, when we think male and female, let me just be honest. When you, when you walk in the room and you think that God created us male and female, each one of you have your own preconceived notions of maleness and own preconceived notions of femaleness, right? Now, we're called to think like what the Bible teaches. We want to have a, a complete biblical worldview, and yet all of us are, are affected by how our culture views things. Not only how our, our large culture, the culture of the West, the culture of 21st century America, but your culture. How did you experience women in your own home? How were men treated in your home growing up? You have a vision in your mind of maleness and femaleness. Everybody does, right? And oftentimes what you see happening in the culture, you see the, the pendulum swinging in a reaction against the things that are bad in the culture. So if you have this, this uh, thing that is being lifted up as men as being machismo and, and strong and the, you know, the, the Clint Eastwoods of, of, the, of, of yesteryear, right? This is the thing that's, that's highlighted, the, the Rambos and the Rockies and the James Bonds. Well, what happens is you have this, this, this change that happens, right? Where you have men who are a little bit more um, goofy and um, you know, inept. Those are the things that are kind of highlighted in popular culture where they can't fix things and they need to have their, their, their strong, independent, tough, strong wives be able to do that for them. So you see this kind of happening all the time. These pendulums are are swinging back and, and forth. All that to say, I just want you guys to be honest, both of you who are here, male and female, right? There's only two of you here, male and female, right? There's only two options, male and female. Both of you have conceptions on the other, okay? Now, what I'm saying, the church has believed and the church has understood for 2,000 years. I am not going to say anything revolutionary tonight. But when we look at our culture, it's revolutionary. It's revolutionary that male and female are created equal. And number three, male and female are different, right? The, the fact that I can say male and female are different and that be a revolutionary concept is crazy, right? Think about how fast the, the, the cultural revolution has hit uh, America. Well, we, we know that um, male and female are, are the same in form or essence, uh, they're equal, and yet they're different. And we really find that rooted in, in, in the Trinity him, himself. We have Father, Son, and, and Spirit, and yet they, they are all equal. There's co-equality in the Trinity, and yet there is, is different. They're different. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not neither the Father nor, nor the Son. So we see the, the oneness, and yet we see the, the difference. And as we see that even in... in, in, in um, Genesis 126, let us, let us a, maybe an allusion to the Trinity, let us make man in our image. Male and female, he created them. So there is, 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 is they, are, they are both equal and yet they are, are different. This has been a, a, a thought throughout the history of the church. And yet there is distinct roles even before the fall. Some would say that, um, that the roles were... Um, that we are going to talk about tonight are were created as a construct of society, right? That it was the patriarchal system that that kind of created this this dichotomy. That men and women are are equal, yes, but they're also the same. That a woman can do and should do everything that a man does, and a man should do and 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 can do everything that a woman does. That's the that's the narrative that's happening. Now, we see the, the detrimental effects of that now, but that started in, in like the 70s and the 80s, into the 90s. Well, we didn't know the, where it was going, did we? 
We had no thoughts when all of us who were growing up in the 90s, you know, watching MTV, that we would eventually see a pregnant man. Huh? That, that, that people could, that would actually change their, their genders. Right? We, would, we, we couldn't even uh, possibly imagine that's where it was going. But that was the same messaging that started in the 80s and the 90s. This is the thing that what happens when you, when you have an unbiblical worldview, when you start doing things in a way that dishonors the scriptures, it takes you to places that you never thought you would go. Now, we've seen this in our own life of sin. You, you start to, to, to fudge on one thing and then another thing, and before you know it, you're doing things. How did I get here? Well, it's because anytime you deny a biblical worldview and doing things God's way, it takes you to destruction. That's what we're seeing in our society. But if you look back in Genesis 1 and 2, I'll just make references here, um, that there was distinct roles even before the fall. God created Adam first and then Eve. This is the same thing that Paul references in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, God gave Adam authority over Eve, even giving Adam the ability to name Eve, which is kind of a curious narrative. You read this narrative, and, and Adam, the first thing he says after Eve was tempted, right, and, and fell to the, to the lie of the serpent, is that you would expect Eve to have a different name, but she's not the, the, the mother of all the, those who will die, but the mother of the living. There is hope even there. The, 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 the idea of race is, is talking about humanity, right? right? There's something uniqueness about the man in terms of we're identified. Uh, God spoke to Adam first after the fall, right? That was the identification of, of control and responsibility. Uh, Adam, not Eve, represents the whole human race. We get this from uh, Romans chapter 5. It says, in Adam all die. It doesn't say in Adam and Eve all die. It says in Adam because Adam is the one who's giving, uh, maybe is, is, is head or has authority there. Um, the, the curse does affect the roles of, of male and female, as we read in Genesis chapter 3, but they're not given new roles. It's not like there's this fall happening, so now we have to change who a woman is and, and who a man is. And what we see happening all throughout the New Testament is that redemption in Christ reaffirms, reaffirms or reestablishes um, the roles of the created order. So when you, when you look at male, maleness and femaleness, here's just what I want, want to draw out, is that our maleness and our femaleness has a lot more to do with who God created us to be than just our external bodies. So there is a, I am more male outside of just my, my, my body, and you are more female just outside of your body. There are certain things that would, that would differentiate those things. But my maleness goes deeper to my core. It goes inside in terms of my very nature, right? Because remember, Adam was put there to, to work and keep the garden, to, to guard it, right? The, the failure of, of Adam to not guard uh, Eve, his wife, from the, the serpent was why we got into this, this mess. And I think what our society wants to do is our society wants to say it's only external, right? That your maleness or your femaleness is only external. So you can change your external, right? Or that may be what you feel on the inside. You want to make a reality on, on the outside. And really, when we talk about this idea of transgender or changing who your gender is, what, what you're doing is you're, you're defying God at, at its very core. God made you this way, and you're saying, no, God, you didn't make me this way. I want to be this way. It's an affront to our creator. It's, a, it's an attack on his authority. And you can see that the seeds of this attack on God's authority all the way back from the Enlightenment, right? When, when the Enlightenment started, they, they started saying that, you know, God was the one who was the judge, and we were the ones who were on trial. Well, what happened in the Enlightenment, that, that changed, and, 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 and man was on the throne, and, and the, the judge who was being judged was the Lord. That, that kind of shifted things. Well, this, this individual autonomy where I am king, I can do whatever I want. Well, if I can do whatever I want, then I can change my gender. If I can live any which way I want because there's no king over me, right? There's no one that I fear over me. Well, then I can live and do anything that I want. And, you know, the, what's happening in our culture is this idea of transgenderism and this, this, this um, language like we want to be uh, binary and, and all this crazy I, I, I ideology, that is part and parcel to all our kids are hearing. Our kids are hearing that he and she is wrong, that they and them are right. This is just something that, that, that our kids are breathing in. 
right? Now, we're sending all our kids to their classes now, and, and they're being taught the, the Bible, they're being taught the, the truth of God's Word, but when they leave this place, and when they, when they open up their phones and they look on YouTube, and a video comes up as a commercial right before they watch their, their three-minute short or their 30-second thir- short, what you're going to find is transgenderism is going to be woven in there, right? This is just something that we can't ignore. So how does this idea of maleness and females, how does it affect the church? One of the things that we want to start to do as elders in this church is we want to model God's creative order. So in God's creative order, he created male and female equal, yet they have different roles. So we believe that that God has been very clear in Ephesians chapter 5 and elsewhere in Scripture that the head of the church is Jesus Christ, and God has put men in authority of the church, right, as elders, and in the home. So in the church and the home, the man is the authority. And that's really just from Genesis 1. All the things I just laid out for you in terms of what happened even before the fall. God just reaffirmed the same responsibility, but now he's just saying it's going to be harder. So men are called to, to lead the home. So, so husbands, fathers, you're called to be the authority of your home, to lead sacrificially. You know, a lot what, what, what Drew, Pastor Drew said this, this weekend. And what you're doing there is you're doing the, God, the way God cre- who God created you to be. When you lead and have the authority in your family, what you're doing is you're doing exactly who God created you to be for his glory. There's something in you leading that is radiating the glory of God to your wife and to your children. And wives, your job is to come alongside and be the, the helper for your husband. In Genesis chapter 2, you see that. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. And as, again, as Drew pointed out this weekend, helper is, is referred to in other places of Scripture as God himself. God is the helper of his people, right? God said he was going to send the Holy Spirit who would be our, 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 our helper uh, to, to, to lead us into all truth. This is what God has given us, women to be helpers, to, to help the, the man and the home reflect the character of, of Christ, which means in our church, we're trying to model that. Here's, the, here's always the challenge when you're leading a church, is that we want a church that reflects the, the, the God's word in every aspect of life, okay? So how do, how do you do that? Well, one of the things that I have kind of decided and tried to let, lead the church in this way is that when our young people, when they're entering into their, their teenage years, when they're entering into um, their, their high school years, when they're really learning what does it mean to be a man and what does it mean to be a, a woman? What does it mean to be a male? What does it mean to be a female? Like, not just my external gender, but who am I? At my core, what is that? We, we want to model that. So in our, in our high school classes, we have men as teachers, and women maybe co-teachers are coming alongside or underneath a, a, a male teacher. We often now have, we have our split classes on Sunday morning. We have women teaching our, our, our teenage girls, and we have men teaching our, our, our boys. Well, why are we doing that? It's because we're trying to, to model God's creative order. Because we're trying to radiate the, the beauty and the majesty and the, the beautiful design of God, our Savior, God, our King, God, our infinite wisdom in how we even structure our church. So they, they may go into society and see different things, but when they come here, they see something of, of, of the heart of God in creation, that the men in our congregation are leading by serving, are laying their lives down for the body. That's really what we want to be as elders. We do not want to be propped, propped up, right? We want to be laid low. We want to, like, like the Lord Jesus, take off our, 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 our outer robe and lay down and wash the feet of the, of the people of God, right? The, the, the calling to be an elder, the calling to be a leader in the life of a, of a home or the church is, is a call to die. It's to die to self and to give yourself for the body of, of Christ. You'll, you'll notice in our services, uh, we typically just have, there's a lot of men stepping up and leading. There's, there's women leading in different ways. We have several women who help lead our, our worship, help lead our, our singing. Um, but there's something when we want to like, lead an authority, we're trying to show God's creative order, right? Now, we don't want to ever show that women are not valued, not loved, and not equal with men. That's not what we want, right? But we want to try to do something in terms of how our church is structured that we are cr- showing God's creative glory in how he made the world. Now, we may get that wrong, right, sometimes. We may go too far in some places and maybe not be free in others. Those are, those are things that we're going to have to live with, okay, as elders, and we're always wrestling and thinking through those things. But here's what happens. There's, there's a push that's coming from our culture that we want to be aware of. We, we're, we're never going to drift into biblical truth. 
we're always going to drift from it, right? We don't just walk in to become more holy and more righteous and more obedient to the scriptures. We're going to drift away from it. So we just have to be careful. And you have to be careful in terms of how you're thinking about maleness and how you're thinking about femaleness. Because there may be some of you here that, that you think maleness is dominant. And that's ungodly, right? Men are not called to be dominant. They're called to be servants. And your authority does not mean that you're the one who's, who's heavy-handed. The one who's in authority is the one who serves and the one who steps out, guards, protects, and even in Ephesians chapter 5, cleanses, right? You know, there's that cleaning and uh, washing with the word. You know, even that, that idea, that word washing is often described as what maybe someone would do in the home for cleaning. Well, that's, that's really what God calls husbands to do, to, to wash their families with, with the word. So all that to say is if there's things that you see in the life of our church that do not reflect God's creative, creative order, let us know. Hey, but if, could we, because listen, as, as, a, as a church, there's always going to be unintended consequences for, for doing point A, Right? Like I, told, like, like I said, in the 80s and 90s, we were trying to say that men and women are equal and yet the, and, and yet the same in form and function. Well, what ends up happening, you see that whatever a woman could do, a man could do. You see where it's gotten to us in our culture. Well, there may be things that we're doing in the life of our church that may not be wise. I'll give you a perfect example. We have, uh, oftentimes, we have brothers read scripture on Sunday morning and then they pray a prayer of confession. Uh, for a time, what we asked, God, we asked men to do before they, they prayed a prayer of confession was to write out their prayer because we wanted them to be, to be thoughtful and prepared when they read or prayed God's prayed before the Lord on Sunday morning, right? What ended up happening is that our prayers, instead of being um, teaching our people to pray the scriptures, we were teaching people to pray formally. And there was a formality that happened in the life of our church that kind of created this structure that we're trying to train people to approach God in a very wooden way. Well, that's not good. But, I mean, the intent was good, right? We want you to be prepared. But the outcome of that was wrong. And a brother kind of made that comment. And I'm like, you know what? You're exactly right. So now what do we do? So we read the scripture. If you want to write it out to be, to be prepared, and that's you, that's fine. But we want you to soak yourself in that scripture. Think about what the church needs to, con- to confess. Confess that sin uh, corporately to the body. And you don't have to write it out. We just want you to be saturated in the scripture. That was really helpful for us. I think it's helpful for the church. So there may be things that we're doing right now in our leadership that may not be beneficial, but let's, let's let us know, okay? So what does it mean for the church? There's, there's lots of reasons why that means for our church, right? But what's gonna happen is, is that people in our church, by God's grace, are gonna get saved, right? People from the culture are gonna come in our church and they're gonna get saved. They're gonna bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and they're gonna be remade into his image, right? And guess what? They're not gonna understand what we're doing it's going to seem oppressive. It's going to seem maybe too male heavy, right? But we don't want to be male heavy because God created us male and female, right? There's so much wisdom and so much strength in in the women of our church. I remember talking to a brother a couple years ago and I just kind of asked him, hey, what do you see in the life of our church? And they said, man, I see so many strong, godly women. It's so beautiful to see. And that, that was said two years ago and I would say the same is true today by God's grace. More and more, I would say. So what does this idea mean to our culture? It means that our culture is very confused. Our culture is very confused. And it's on the attack. If you are a teacher in the public school system, you don't need to be told this. This is the world that you live in. If you are a nurse, right, this is the world that you you live in. Right? If you work in any sort of corporate America, this is the bell of goods that you're being told to do. It started out with we want to affirm that anyone can love anyone they want. So if you are a male, you can love another man, and, and God should say, that's okay. Well, God very clearly says in Romans chapter 1 that that's not okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. That was the first thing. And then they, 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 they made it go a little farther. Now you have to say, it's okay if you were created a male by God in his infinite, perfect wisdom, you're actually, it's okay for you to, to defy that and become a woman. That's what you're being told to do. So when I preached a couple, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Daniel chapter one, and Daniel said, we are, we are not gonna eat the food from the king's table. This is the line that we're gonna draw. All of us are gonna have to make a, a line drawn in the sand, right, 
And I think the issue that we're going to have to draw the line in the sand is, is going to be on maleness and femaleness. I can't believe I would have even said that 10 years ago, but that's where we are. Now, some of us are going to choose to draw that line in different places, right? Some of them are going to say, you know what, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm a teacher, and they want me to use pronouns, and I'm going, to, I'm going to use those pronouns, and here's why I'm going to use those pronouns. I want to stay in the classroom. I want to have influence there, or I'm going to try my best not to use those pronouns, but I'm going to call them by their nickname if they want to call themselves a different name because I'm, I'm trying to win them. Now, we may say, hey, I don't think that's wise, right? I think you're drawing the line too far. Or you're not drawing the line far enough. This is going to be the battle in our church over the next five to ten years, right? Because we're going to, be, we're going to be pressed to make these decisions, right? And if you don't think that you're going to be pressed now, you will be pressed, right? But guess what happens, right? When you come to Christ, your, your, your mind is being remade and renewed, right? So as our culture continues to go down, the, the witness of the church needs to even shine even brighter, right? So we, we don't need just to, to, to be like, happy in our marriages and like to, to stay together and not get divorced. No, we need husbands to radiate the glory of God and how they love their wives. We need wives to radiate the glory of God and how they submit and respect their husbands because that's going to look different and weird and strange and glorious to the world. And they walk into our church and they need to see this is glorious. I don't understand it, but there's something that's captivating me, that's, that's drawing me into this place, because the, the, the culture is going to go farther and farther downhill, and it will reap more and more destruction in their lives. And we have to be there with open arms and welcome them in, because God created us male and female in him so we can reflect his glory to the world. Father, we love you, and we thank you that you have made us male and female. We pray that we would model that well in our congregation. In Jesus' name, amen.